Good afternoon and welcome. I'm John Kosworth, the Provost of the University, and it is my distinct pleasure uh, to be able to introduce to you today the President of the Republic of Costa Rica, Luis Guillermo Solis Rivera. Let me begin by thanking the Institute of Latin American Studies for co-sponsoring this event and acknowledge the presence here of the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Worship, Manuel Gonzalez, and the First Lady of Costa Rica, Mercedes Peñas Domi. I would also like to thank you all and all the members of the delegation from Costa Rica that are here for joining us, as well as Chaplain Davis and Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who are also participating. President Solis was born in San Jose, Costa Rica in 1958. The son of a shoemaker, he has spent his life immersed in the, words, in the worlds of academia and government. He received degrees in history and Latin American studies from the University of Costa Rica and Tulane. He was a Fulbright scholar and has taught at the University of Costa Rica, the University of Michigan, and Florida International University. His political career has included high-level positions in Costa Rica's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, including Ambassador at Large for Central American Affairs and Director General for Policy. Under his leadership, Costa Rica has been lauded for its embrace of sustainable development and the quality of life its citizens enjoy. The country sits regularly atop the Happy Planet Index, recognized for its high life expectancy, low ecological footprint, and the overall, the overall well-being of its people. It's a great honor to welcome the President back to Colombia this year. He seems always to be engaged in the most intractable and critical uh, decisions and concerns of the day. Last year, he came to Morningside Heights to discuss the migration crisis that continues to grip Latin America and the world. You may remember that his country was and remains at the center of that crisis, with migrants fleeing violence in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, now as well Venezuela, to seek refuge in countries like Costa Rica and the United States. Today, President Solis has come to discuss yet another daunting crisis that threatens to upend global peace and stability and that is nuclear war. This past year, Costa Rica led a conference at the United Nations that drafted an international treaty banning nuclear weapons. In July, more than 120 nations voted to adopt the agreement, the first of its kind. And yesterday at the UN, nations began signing that document. As expected, the nine countries that possess nuclear weapons, including the United States, did not participate. Most members of NATO also abstained. Some critics contend that the agreement will do little to deter countries like North Korea, Russia, and China from keeping their nuclear arms. Supporters argue that their actions will hopefully lead, uh, build momentum to the growing pressure that will impel nations to begin thinking seriously about the pledge that pres former President Obama made that is the goal of uh, eliminating nuclear weapons altogether. I'm sure you're eager to hear about this issue from President Solis today. His address is entitled, Towards a Nuclear Weapons-Free World, the Nuclear Ban Treaty. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to the President of the Republic of Costa Rica, Luis Guillermo Solis Rivera. Welcome back. Thank you very much, and good morning to all. <clears throat> I do thank, uh, on behalf of my delegation, myself, Mercedes, uh, the great opportunity to be here. And I thank Dr. Cothsworth, uh, the Latin American Studies Institute, and all of you for allowing me to come and share with you some thoughts on this very important issue of denuclearization and, uh, and why it is that Costa Rica continues to support this pathway towards uh, a more secure world free of nuclear weapons and built upon the notions of international solidarity, peace, and justice. Now, in preparing for this lecture, I prepared a, you know, a, a big speech. But then I realized that maybe it would be more interesting to propose a different uh, approach today. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'll give you a 10-minute opening remark um, presentation. 
And then I'm going to ask uh, Ambassador Elaine White, who presided over the commission that drafted the convention to outlaw the, um, human, uh, the, the nuclear weapons, to come and speak for another 10 minutes and then open up for discussions. I think that <clears throat> this would probably be more interesting. And then you get two speakers for the price of one. Um, and you get the, the uh, lead figure in the negotiation, who, was, who is our ambassador to the UN organizations in Geneva, to have the opportunity to share with you uh, the highlights of the negotiations. You know, as a professor, as an academic, and I've been a professor for 35 years, I always treasured the opportunity to learn from the, uh, from the makers of these international agreements uh, their experiences and where were the knots of the negotiation and the more difficult parts and how the inner dealings of the neg negotiations went about. And since um, we don't have the limitations of secrecy, at least I don't, uh, maybe she, she has to be more, uh, less candid than I, but I'm, I'm sure she won't be. She's also a professor. I, I thought that it would be interesting simply to hear uh, some of her insights to the process and how she sees from uh, the um, insights of the system, of the United Nations system, the likelihood of the treaty to continue unraveling in the next few years. Just yesterday, just yesterday, 50 out of the original 122 cre uh, creators of the treaty signed, signed it. So we now see that process underway. Once we have 50 ratifications, and there were two or three that were issued yesterday as at the time of the signing, at the signing ceremony, then the treaty will enter into effect. So, you know, we are very hopeful that this will happen in the next few years. Um, at any rate, let me begin by saying that uh, the aspiration of a nuclear-free wor world is something that makes sense. And uh, I say this because, uh, quite frankly, sometimes we get too philosophical about it. And I think there is a case to be made about the morality of nuclear weapons and how uh, we should look at it. You know, and, and, and sometimes I have proposed, following the logic that another Costa Rican president once used, that for all practical purposes, um, the way in which we deal with drugs um, and, and, and the way drugs are seen in, in, in many developed countries are for moral purposes equally uh, to equal to what one can say about weapons, regular weapons and clearly weapons of mass destruction. I mean, what's, what's the ultimate moral difference between selling a product that kills white and non-white youngsters in the developed world to that logic of weapons that kill not, un, not white and white uh, young people in the third world. It's the same thing. It's no difference at all from a moral point of view. But, you know, beyond that, beyond the ethics of war, which can be so complicated and, and so absurd, there is a question of do we want to survive or not? And obviously this time around, in the 72nd General Assembly of the United Nations, we've been talking about that uh, all the time. Uh, we, we did that when we talked about climate change, whose commitments in, in the Paris Accords and, and Marrakech, Costa Rica continues, continues to uphold at all costs. We feel that there should be no regression whatsoever on those agreements and that the world should stand very firmly uh, to, uh, to ensure that the uh, very difficult, difficulty crafted mechanism in Paris um, is, is kept and it moves forward. Uh, may it be in the case of nuclear weapons, may it be in the case um, of inclusion, and particularly that of women, which we also have been fostering strongly uh, for the last few years in the United Nations as part of a high-level panel that was convened by the Secretary General of the United Nations. Costa Rica has, has insisted in the need of, of women to be part of, to, to be included uh, creatively, forcefully, and decently into the world's economy and that they should be economically empowered, which is the next generation of agreements that are much needed other than the political ones. I mean, giving the women the, the opportunity to become active 
members of the economy in equal conditions as men. And we, we, we have been upholding that. Well, no, we have been think, talking about issues upon which the future of humanity depends. And yes, there is a debate, clearly, uh, regarding the, uh, the convenience of having or not having uh, weapons of mass destructions, such as nuclear weapons, um, curtailed by international agreements. In fact, there is a, 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 a discussion about multilateralism, whether uh, the logic of international solidarity should be uh, impo imposed upon or, or um, fostered in order to limit the individual capacity of states to do whatever they want. That was clearly poised uh, in the United Nations this week. But we feel very strongly that it also uh, comes to be a matter of common sense. Do we want to survive or we don't? I mean, are we willing to make small national sacrifices in order to ensure that the larger global challenges are adequately dealt with? And who is there to uh, do the job? So, you know, in, in, with, with nuclear matters, this is, this is the case, clearly the case. And Costa Rica, which, as you know, is a country that has no army, in 1948, we abolished the armed forces as a permanent institution. We, we confide on international law and the police force, and it has sufficed so far uh, to, um, to grant the security we need in the country and allow us to invest the monies that would have gone to the armed forces into other purposes, education and housing and health and so forth. Um, the, the fact that we can count on uh, the vast majority of the general, U UN General Assembly member states in this quest for a denuclearized world is something that, upon which uh, our own survival depends. And this is the case for most countries in the world. You know, and yes, we, we do understand, believe me, the complexities uh, which denuclearizing the world entails. I mean, there's no question about it. And uh, this is not only a, a matter of politics, it's also a matter, we were just discussing this with Ambassador uh, White Gomez when we were coming, uh, driving towards Colombia. You know, the, the technicalities of denuclearization are to be dealt with. And it has to be a very carefully drafted process. We, we cannot um, stampede over uh, the, the technical questions that denuclearizing uh, imposes upon nations. And everybody has to agree in good faith and things that are not common in international politics or in politics in general ought to be put in front of these agreements. So, you know, I'm, I'm not Immanuel Kant. I'm not a pacifist uh, by all means. And I think that sometimes you have to resort to force in order to uh, protect the larger good. But this is not the case with nuclear war. Nuclear war is based upon the notion of extermination. There's, there's no way around it. I mean, you, you cannot, once, once you use those weapons, the path towards mutual assured destruction is open, it's wide open. And uh, it would be very difficult to imagine that a new nuclear attack, because we only, we've only had two so far over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, would be limited in scope. And truly, one can say that the uh, likelihood of a government um, making the voluntary uh, move of destroying another one using nuclear weapons is unlikely at this point, more or less unlikely. Okay? But there are other possibilities as well. Not only the fact that a rogue state could start a war, which would immediately unravel reactions that could end up in a, in a larger conflict with the potential of um, extermination of the, of the human family, but also terrorism, which, as we know, um, could take hold of some of these weapons and, and cause tremendous damage with or without the support of a state. So far, this is only the, the, has been in the minds of, of James Bond's films. But, uh, but it could happen. We've seen unexpected things occurring in, in the world during the last few years. And I, 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 I uh, fear that we could see even 
worse ones in the near future. So I, I think we ought to understand then that this is part of a, of a new reality. And the fact that the superpowers, the, mem the B5, the members of the Security Council, UN Security Council, which of course um, are nuclear weapon bearers, um, and other states that are not members of the Security Council but do have weapons and that we know of, and there may be other countries that have the weapons and we don't, we don't know that they do, or officially do not know that they have the weapons, are not participating in the treaty. And a lot of people say, well, if they're not in, then the treaty is useless because the ones who should be involved in the first line are not willing to put on their part. I, I quite frankly and respectfully um, submit that they're wrong. 122 countries' voices, uh, as they have been um, put in that declaration, sends a very strong moral message and also are testimonies of the new condition in the world, in the world community. For once, uh, it, it says a lot about the end of the Cold War and the possibility of nations to take decisions by themselves aside from uh, the original, the original bearers of, of, world, of, of world control. Secondly, it also bears testimony to the strength of civil society, which took a very important part in the construction of this agreement. I like to quote Tip O'Neill, you know, you know the, so, the famous um, chair of the House of Representatives for so many years in the United States when he, saw, when he said that all, lo all politics is local. Well, this is a good example of that. In the, the weight of civil society within countries and the international civil society as a whole in supporting this effort is something to be reckoned with. And I think it shows the importance of, um, of the people taking control of certain issues that used to be presented to us or to the people as givens. Not anymore. There is a voice, a very strong voice coming from the civil society. And it, and it also bears, I think, testimony to the fact that we're more conscientious of the global responsibilities which we have. We have grown to be more aware of the fact that you know, small international actions have huge national consequences. And that unless we are capable of fathoming the depth of those consequences to our well-being and to the well-being of future generations, this is the whole idea of sustainability. Jeff Sachs, Jeff Sachs is not here now because he had to another engagement, but we have been so we should be so grateful to his efforts to um, to make us understand the importance of sustainability. I mean, the long term, um, as as a transcendental uh, feature of today's world. I mean, that logic of sustainability, the fact that very small impacts can ha in, in the international system can have huge consequences in the local arena is something that I think we should treasure very much. And this is a, a, an awareness that has brought the international community to higher levels of maturity, higher levels of understanding. You know, we, we, we live in a world of, of high-speed decisions, decision-making. And one of the things I, I um, I um, would like to go to when I finish my period as president uh, is the possibility to think before I have to decide, you know, sometimes you know, this thing has forced us to make decisions without thinking what we do because simply we have to respond so fast that there's no time for reflection whatsoever. Um, and. Um, and immediate being the immediate response to everything has brought a, is part of our pragmatic way of seeing life. You know, we, we make decisions as a matter of fact all the time, which is fine. I mean, generally, um, I don't think that this is necessarily negative, but there are parts in, in the in the old in the, the larger perspective of life where you need to to think, to sit down and think, and think in the long term.
and be able to see the wider perspective, the longer, the longer frontier of things, and, and to transcend the immediate, the immediate. Well, with nuclear weapons and with the facility of destroying the world, with climate change and the facility of hurting the world, we have that possibility. You know, your grandparents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents didn't have the possibility to make a difference in many of the things they endured. We do. We have the technical no the capacities, we have the scientific knowledge, we have the sociological perspective to do things differently. And this is why I, I find this uh, treaty to ban nuclear weapons to be so immensely important, important because we can make a difference. Yes, it's true that, you know, uh, any country bearing nuclear weapons can just push the button and, and do a horrible mess around the world. And that that can be done with or without a treaty. I mean, if, if you look at that pragmatically, that's that. And so let us all pray to our different, in our different religious um, understandings that this may not, ha may not happen. But if we're able to build up a human understanding edifice of conventions, of laws and norms, and of political logics that could prevent that, we should be able, we should and we must do it for the sake of the rest of humanity. That, that has not been born yet. And all of us are in one way or another responsible for their well-being as somebody else was responsible for ours back in the past. So I'm, um, I'm extremely grateful with the 122 countries that uh, agreed upon the treaty. I'm very grateful and, and also very honored that a Costa Rican woman uh, chaired the committee that was able to put together this convention and that she was also a, um, and she, she's also been a professor, so she's an academic, she's a member of this community. So we're, we're useful after all, Dr. Coatsworth, even when some people think the universities have, could be closed with no consequences. Um, and now I would like to, to give her the opportunity to tell us a little bit about the, about the, the procedure, how this, this, this treaty, this convention was, was, uh, was crafted, and uh, what are some of the details that would be interesting for such an audience to understand the immensity of the task that we have in front of us. And I can tell you that as a small country, Costa Rica has very, uh, small, has, has very little possibility to be a world actor in, in terms of you know, the larger picture. We, we are small. And, and, but we do have the moral authority to call for, uh, for international peace because this is how we have been able to survive in a very difficult world. And 72 years after this, explosions in Japan, and bearing in mind that there are still people who are suffering from those impacts, the Hibakushas, whom we have been, who have been very present along the, the negotiation of this treaty, that we can still do a lot to prevent and to make it unnecessary to restore to nuclear war as uh, a symbol of the new times we live. So let us be optimistic and hopeful that in shaping this new world, we could do it on the basis of justice, on the basis of peace and sustainable development to all. And I now would like to introduce you to Ambassador Lane White, and then after that open for questions from the moderator will help us with that, but I would like everybody to feel welcome to ask questions, both to uh, Ambassador uh, uh, White, to myself, and to participate in what I hope will be a very interesting debate for the rest of the time we have available for this conference. I thank you very much. Ambassador, please. Good morning to you all. I would like to say that I am very honored to be able to share this podium with uh, President Solis, whom we all know that has been a very renowned scholar in Costa Rica for many, uh, many years. So I'm very happy to be able to 
to share this experience and um, uh, somewhat share also the knowledge that we have uh, gained in this process. One of the, the first questions that I have been asked is why Costa Rica? And many people have asked, you know, nuclear disarmament is, is, is high politics and you don't even have an army. How can you contribute to this process if you don't, you know, even have a, a knowledge about military affairs? Um, so the first issue I would, uh, I would mention, the first, first response to that is that, um, of course, we do understand the nature of um, international politics and the international politics of disarmament which is essential for conducting this, uh, this process. But at the same time, Costa Rica uh, is an expert in decision making within the rule of law. We are a, a consolidated democracy and all Costa Rican citizens, it is in our DNA to be able to, to know how to conduct decision making with this democratic inclusive uh, process that is at the same time respectful of the rule of law. Um, in an international diplomatic conference that has been um, called for by the General Assembly, it's a very formal decision-making process. So the first contribution that we, uh, that we gave this process is this very, um, I would say, entrenched uh, know-how that we as Costa Ricans have to conduct processes in a transparent and, and inclusive matter that at the same time is very respectful of the rules. Um, secondly, it is true that Costa Rica has been engaged in, in norm development throughout the years, and especially Costa Rica, when President Solis was the Director General of Foreign Policy, uh, promoted a, a comprehensive convention on nuclear disarmament back in the year 1996. But this is not, I mean, we were not discussing a comprehensive convention. The General Assembly in December of 2016 um, took the decision to convene a negotiating conference to prohibit nuclear weapons. And the first thing that the conference that the General Assembly did was to provide a very um, straightforward mandate for this conference which was to negotiate a prohibition instrument, a treaty, that would first of all strengthen and complement the current architecture for nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. And this is very important because we were not, we were not creating a norm uh, from scratch. We were creating a norm um, already from the knowledge that we had in the system of what works, what does not work, especially also um, departing from the already agreed language in, in, in other texts and treaties, which was a very important factor of why we were able to um, finish with the negotiation in three weeks, which is a record time um, in diplomatic history. At the same time, this um, process had to be inclusive. It had to respond to the sense of urgency that the new international situation demands. We had to conclude as soon as possible, and we had to make a clear distinction between the process of prohibiting the nuclear weapons and the future steps that are needed later on for uh, towards the total elimination of nuclear weapons, which means uh, the actual negotiation of uh, disarmament measures, measures among the stake, I mean the, the nuclear um, powers. And um, let me say then that the, let me um, mention very briefly um, some highlights about the content of the treaty and that will refer to the process. First of all, I would mention three aspects of the treaty that I think it is very important that we all know as citizens of the world. First of all, that nuclear weapons were the only weapons of mass destruction that had not been prohibited in international law. So the first thing that this treaty does, Article 1, is to undertake that prohibition. And uh, it has a very categoric prohibition um, for a wide range of activities related to nuclear weapons, uh, from development, testing, in general terms, production, manufacture, 
manufacturer acquisition, possession, stockpiling, transfer, use, or threatening to use the nuclear weapons, which is, this was a very uh, controversial aspect because by prohibiting the threat of use, one is also delegitimizing nuclear deterrence. Um, it is also prohibited to assist or encourage prohibited acts and to allow other states to station, install, or deploy nuclear weapons on their territory. So it is a very straightforward, very comprehensive prohibition norm. In addition, of course, it will be very easy to negotiate a, a, a treaty among nuclear, non-nuclear states. Um, and that was the, the initial focus of the treaty, but the conference was completely determined to open the door for nuclear states to join the treaty from day one. So that created a very important complexity in the negotiations so that we create uh, norms and procedures, not only for the accession of non-nuclear states, but also for the accession of nuclear powers, meaning a state that has possessed nuclear weapons can destroy the nuclear weapons and then join the treaty, having already become a non-nuclear weapon state. But in addition, there, there are uh, provisions for states, nuclear states, to adhere to the treaty by committing to uh, de-alert the nuclear weapons and to submit a proposal for the destruction of their um, nuclear programs that has to be approved by the Conference of State Parties. So of course they can, they are invited to join, but they have to comply with certain requisites. In addition, we um, were able to establish an appropriate institutional setting to further develop the regime and to further develop all the issues that we are not able to negotiate at this moment because the complexity of negotiating um, nuclear disarmament and its verification is, um, well, went beyond the time that we had to negotiate. So we um, gave the Conference of State Parties the responsibility to further develop the measures, even if they are um, legally binding in the, in the shape of additional protocols to the treaty, to further develop the um, measures for nuclear disarmament. In addition, which is also um, um, interesting, uh, consistent with other international humanitarian and human rights law, and in accordance with the principle of state sovereignty, um, the treaty places primary responsibility and control for aiding victims and remedi remediating contaminated environments on the states affected by the use or test of nuclear weapons. And this is, of course, is groundbreaking. However, since the treaty frames nuclear weapons as a threat to the whole humanity, it establishes that addressing the harms of nuclear violence is the duty of all peoples. Therefore, Article 7 expands the circle of responsibility to all members of the treaty, which are required to cooperate and provide technical, material, and financial assistance to help other state parties to meet their obligations in terms of victim assistance and environmental remediation. In addition, Article 7.6 asserts that states joining the treaty that have used or tested nuclear weapons have a responsibility to provide adequate assistance to affected state parties. Again, this is groundbreaking. I would like to mention some aspects of the process because this, um, this treaty has many indicators of success um, in international and diplomatic history. First of all, this is, as far as we are concerned, the treaty that was negotiated in the shortest uh, period. So we were, we, the, the, the process um, benefited from different uh, um, determinants that I would like to mention. First of all, we had a very clear mandate. And the mandate, as I said, was to confine the instrument to the prohibition norm and not to uh, start developing the, um, the, the processes of nuclear disarmament, which are completely complex and that should be devoted once the nuclear armed states are, are sit at the table. Second, the conference um, 
benefited from the fact that um, the rules of procedure of the conference were approved from day one, uh, which left the delegations with no other options but to devote to the discussions of the substan substantive matters. Third, the conference benefited from methodological innovation, and this is where I would like to bring the issue of the role of academia in the process. Why, why um, was the conference innovative? Um, the conference was innovative because for the first time in disarmament affairs, we were able to open um, for real interactive dialogue between scholars, scientists, uh, civil society uh, representatives, victims, both Ibakushas, um, victims of, uh, of the use in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also of victims of uh, nuclear testings uh, throughout the world, and delegations, scientists and inheritance. So the first um, influence of academia, being an academic, um, was that we promoted confrontation of ideas. And that was very helpful and refreshing for all the delegations, and it helped improve the knowledge creation, management, and exchange among delegations and all the, um, the conference that um, was an open and inclusive uh, process. At some point, I did um, constitute it as some sort of a, a very informal body of scholars that were uh, advisors to the presidency, uh, to which I resorted to so that they could give me very fresh ideas and analysis of the process. And many times I asked um, scholars and experts and, and um, um, scientists to read what we were uh, negotiating and confront the, and I confronted their uh, inputs uh, with the delegations that were negotiating these aspects. And sometimes the delegations didn't like that very much, but at the end it was very helpful. At some point some, some, of, some even came to me and said, you know, we are government delegates. I mean, we are not here to negotiate with, you know, scholars. But it was truly helpful to be able to shake and to, and to um, every day stress test the, the most technical aspects of the treaty that were being negotiated by the, by the delegations. And I think, um, overall, the conference was able to avert many risks that the opponents of the treaty had mentioned that the treaty was going to have precisely because of that um, open exchange between um, academia, uh, experts, and delegations. And last but not least, the conference was able to benefit from a very, very strong political determination that had been forged throughout the years um, and that grew out of the frustration of these 122 of the majority of the international community with the slow pace of multilateral nuclear disarmament negotiations. And also, um, this determination also benefited from the um, increasing um, evidence and updated evidence of the scientific, the, the scientific and the diplomatic and the um, academic community were able to exchange about the catastrophic consequences of nuclear weapons and what exactly it will mean today in 2017 or 2016, what it will mean today to have a nuclear detonation. And uh, the, the scientific evidence was um, so, so horrendous for the international community that the international uh, community decided that the way in which we discuss nuclear disarmament in multilateral forum could not be only focused on uh, nuclear deterrence or you know, just the determinants of, um, of nuclear um, mutual assured, uh, assured uh, uh, destruction, but it had to incorporate the discussion about the, ha the catastrophic humanitarian consequences. And this movement grew politically and socially in such terms that all the delegations that were there, the 122 countries, were a very solid uh, support coalition that was able and determined to bring the treaty to a conclusion um, very soon. 
In uh, the issue of force, I would also, I also like to think that the presidency also was a, a, a good contributing factor. Um, and of course, I would have to, to come to the, the role that Costa Rica has played in international politics and the fact that um, we were uh, perceived as an honest broker in the negotiation, meaning that we were not neutral, but we were completely committed to the achievement of the, of the, of the mandate that we uh, received from the General Assembly. We were committed in, in making the conference move towards the fulfillment of the mandate. But we were perceived as an honest broker, among other things, uh, not only because of the, uh, of the role that Costa Rica has played, but also because I myself had not been engaged in um, nuclear politics before. So it, it was a fresh uh, new leadership and um, people could not encapsulate me in, in one uh, thought or the other and that gave me a lot of possibility to bridge, um, to bridge uh, positions. Last but not least, um, there is a point in which, of course, the presidency has to, um, has to promote at some point, has to um, offer the conference with a proposed text. The conference has to negotiate. Uh, the text, and the president has to update that text that is under discussion. But there is a point in which the presidency understands that there is no more room, not only in terms of time, but also in, in terms of negotiating, in, 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 in terms of negotiation, maneuvering. There is no more space to further discuss. And the role of the presidency is to make the conference understand that what we have before us is the best deal that we can arrive at and to convince them that this is the deal and you can go for it. And that, of course, it's, it's, it's very difficult, but at some point it was very um, um, successful in that terms, in those terms, and we were able to, to have a solid um, group of the majority, the vast majority of the international community to agree on this new international norm that from now on we have to devote ourselves to strengthening and, and um, developing the, the links, appropriate links with the rest of the architecture, meaning the Treaty of the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, as well as the, the Treaty on the, on the, um, that prohibits the, the nuclear testing, and the rest of the architecture, both institutional and conventional regimes that exist in um, in the, at the UN level. But above all, we do hope that this treaty is going to uh, push, is going to uh, give a very important political push for the disarmament uh, negotiations uh, together with the urgency and the urge that we acquire by, just by reading the news of, uh, about what is going on in the world. I want to thank you and um, be ready for an exchange, Professor, if you want to ask me questions. Thank you, um, President Solis and Ambassador White. Uh, my name is Esteban Andrade. I'm the program manager at the Institute of Latin American Studies, and I have the honor to uh, moderate this Q&A session. As you will see, there are two microphones on the aisle. Uh, we ask you to please line up behind the microphones and uh, state your questions. Um, please remember to first uh, give your name and the uh, school affiliation so that President Solis knows who you are. Um, while we wait, I want to thank you for the uh, great speech that you just gave us. Um, it seems like we should be living on a world that should think about de-weaponize, but it seems like we are in a world that is thinking about an arms race. And uh, we could only hope that more nations um, act like yours uh, that don't have an army. So what could militarized nations can learn from demilitarized nations that have prospered in this world, such as Costa Rica? Well, you know, the, the experience of not having an army, I must acknowledge, is rather unique. And um, even when I would advise any country to attempt uh, to go that way, I, I realize that it may not be possible. I mean, the, sometimes even the, the notion of the, of, the, of the nation state is built upon uh, uh, the use of, of arms, the need to, to liberate a nation, which is clearly the case of the United States and some others. So, you know, I always have 
uh, when when I address this issue, I always very I'm always very careful not to give counsel to you know and, and speak in general terms because it can be a problem uh, and I, and it can become a historical. Being a historian, that's uh, something that I take very seriously. But it is, uh, in our experience, uh, not having an armed force as a permanent uh, institution has allowed the country to use its budget elsewhere. I mean, talking about dividends of peace, which was a concept that was generally associated with the, the, the postmodernism and, and the end of the Cold War, we have experienced that for over 70 years, and it has worked for us. I mean, we have been able to um, um, use the, the, the scarce resources of the country in a different way. And uh, that's one thing. And the second thing, it has provided stability in a region, the Latin American region, where, where armed forces, where the armed forces have been um, generally associated with uh, posing serious dangers to institutions, democratic institutions, and governance. Um, yes, go ahead. Thank you very much, President Solis and Ambassador White, for coming and speaking today. Um, I'm a student in Columbia College, a senior studying English literature and ecology, evolution, and environmental biology. And as someone who, you know, both in academia and also reading about the world at large, I was very impressed with both of your dedication, bridging academia into governmental affairs, into especially critical negotiations such as the nuclear treaty. Um, I guess I have one, you know, one main question, which is, what do you think will be necessary for the countries who do not sign on to the nuclear treaty in the negotiations this week. And looking forward, how do you think maybe getting them um, to negotiate and come around? And then a not so political question for both of you as well. Uh, what is your favorite Costa Rican writers? Thank you. The Costa Rican what? I'm sorry? Uh, writers or artists. Oh, artists, yes. okay. Well, believe it or not, I am also placing a lot of um, hope in academia to help us um, in this process because it is true that there has been a, a, a divisive uh, a dialogue. Uh, the nuclear weapon states did not believe that we, um, that the rest of the community, uh, international community, had to move this uh, forward. And in building bridges, I think the, the academia is um, very well placed in order to provide us with um, um, analysis um, with equanimity. And that is going to create some uh, concepts and some bridges of how we can make um, the proper interaction between the, the Ban Treaty and the rest of the architecture, because the Ban Treaty is a reality. Uh, we already have an architecture that has different uh, treaties and institutions, and we need innovation and creativity in order to find new ways of interaction with this newborn a member of the family. Well, it's very difficult because I love music. Escritores. Writers. You mean? Uh, or in general, writers, artists, people who, you know, their creative force inspires you so much, yeah. Mm. Well, it is very difficult because I love music and we have very good musicians. I am, I am afraid that I would, um, um, you know, leave uh, some behind. But let, us, let, let me just mention a couple of them because they are like international um, they are ambassadors of Costa Rica. One of them is called Manuel Obregón. He's a pianist and he, um, is, of course, he's a composer as well. And he has made this very beautiful um, interaction between music and nature. And it has beautiful composition um, devoted to the rainforest and to the dangers of uh, disrupting rainforest. Um, ¿Cómo se llamaba? Manuel Obregón. No, ¿cómo se llamaba la, la composición? Symbiosis. He has a very nice composition ah. called Symbiosis, which is a piano. Um, arrangement with nature, um, imagery, sound, and it's very uh, beautiful. And the other one is Carlos Guzman, who is also a composer, um, and he has able to um, um, compose um, folk music with classical instruments. And he is also he has created very, very beautiful um, pieces. Let me make a brief uh, comment on academia and, and politics and in general international politics. I was very fortunate to participate as one of the 
Costa Rican negotiations in the Central American Peace Plan ba back in 1986 and 87. I was a very young diplomat at the time. Um, and, um, you know, I, it always in, impact me, impacted me a lot how academia was a bridge between thinking, you know, reflection and, and decision making. There was the capacity of academia to order processes, to be able to see, to it put, put issues in a wider in a wider uh, scheme of things, um, and I think, in, especially in negotiated international affair, uh, international matters, it is very important to have more options open than less. You have to continually be looking for Plan B, somehow, and academia provides you with that opportunity. If you do not have uh, scientists of all sorts, social or natural sciences, uh, involved, uh, your scope tends to be much limited and reduced. And, and I think that one of the things that academics and, and people who um, are keen of knowledge uh, are able to is to put that in a more broader sense. The second thing is you are, you are better poised not to repeat errors of the past if you know your history well. And, and thirdly, you can, you can compare, which is another thing that is very important. You seek for processes that are comparable and therefore can be relevant to the solution. And again, as uh, uh, Madam Ambassador has just mentioned, I'll just mention the name of a, a group that is international, Costa Rican group is international and well known, it's called Editus, and they won a Grammy uh, Award and they, you know, they, they're well known for that reason. And in writing, I'm going to mention the most translated Costa Rican author, uh, Carlos Luis Fallas, F-A-A-A, uh, double L A S Fallas, like Fallas. He uh, wrote a book in the 1940s called Mamita Junai, which is uh, the way the former banana workers pronounce United uh, for uh, for United Fruit Company, Mamita Junai United, and it is a it's a it's a it's a depiction of the life of Costa Rica banana workers in the banana enclave enclaves of the 1930s. That has changed a lot, but the the work of Fajas was very well known and very well taken throughout the world. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Good, mor oh. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much, President Solis and Ambassador, for leading um, this uh, treaty. So, trying to find out, you know, to protect the, the war and the global peace. Um, so, my question is about I know that uh, Latin America, almost every country in Latin America signed this treaty. Uh, including my, my home country, Venezuela. So um, my question is about this. Um, which mechanism the treaty has to prevent that country like Venezuela sign this treaty and then mislead uh, the international community by aligning this treaty again? So because it's not a secret that Venezuela has close relationship with Iran and North Korea, and Venezuela can provide the uranium that they need to, you know, to create these, um, these nuclear weapons. So, by the way, thank you so much for everything that you have done to help my people in Venezuela. Thank you so much. Yes, the Ban Treaty actually has a reinforcement of norms that are uh, placed in other instruments, like the uh, Treaty of the Non-Proliferation, to which Venezuela is a state party. And um, the Ban Treaty uh, relies on the same system of um, uh, ver verification and uh, safeguards that um, was already created by the uh, Treaty of the Non-Proliferation. But it, it, even it includes the possibility of developing uh, new uh, standards in, in terms of safeguards. So every country that signs, and actually Venezuela already did, um, is committed to uh, having the same safeguards agreement that, um, that uh, already has with the International Atomic Energy Agency. So there is, there is a complementarity and there is no possibility of form shopping or regime shopping for that regard. So the non-proliferation uh, regime and its uh, verification system applies also for this, uh, for this case. 
I think we should give credit to Latin America for being at the, for, at the forefront of the fight against nuclear weapons. Since 1968, Latin America forged a regional agreement called the Treaty of Tlatelolco that bans the use and production and uh, kept keeping and all, you know, all the list that Ambassador uh, mentioned of, of what weapons of mass destruction and, and nuclear weapons in particular. And we even have a mechanism that uh, it's a verification mechanism for, for the treaty. So, you know, I think that all Latin American countries have been very much engaged in this for a long time. And it is a good example that we would like to point at because it makes it clear that regions can, they have the possibility of forging these agreements and making that possible within those territories. So, uh, obviously, a country can, you know, uh, disrespect the, or irrespect the, the, the community, but the, the sanctions and the mechanisms are in, in, are in place. Hello, Mr. Hello, Mr. President. Uh, thank you for speaking to us today. My name is Ricardo Taveras. Um, I study risk management at uh, the School of Professional Studies. And I wanted to ask you a question in terms of cybersecurity. We understand that nowadays it's a very prominent topic. And the notion that somebody with that's highly trained and with enough resources can just hack the access to, serve, to, to uh, nuclear weapons. What effort, how are you helping mitigate the uh, threats of uh, cybersecurity with regards to nuclear weapons? And another not so political question, um, if you had the opportunity to have lunch with anybody in history, who would that person be and why? <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Uh, do you want to address the cybersecurity? Where did you talk about this in, during the negotiations? Yes, indeed. Well, the, the strong belief that um, the vast majority of the international community has is the, the, the only assurance that we have vis-a-vis um, -vis cybersecurity and other kinds of threats is uh, the total elimination of nuclear weapons. It's the only assurance that we have. And regarding lunch with a historical figure, oh, I have a long list. I can give you a long list of figures. Um, now, I've been asked that question several times, and my regular answer is Gandhi. I would have liked to have lunch with him. But I have a couple more. Uh, one is a woman I have always uh, considered a very uh, powerful figure that I, I would have liked to, to have known, much more to have uh, lunch with her. Um, in her kitchen, because she is supposed to be the person who invented the kitchen cabinet logic, which is Golda Meir, the former Prime Minister of Israel. But the other character that's closer to us, and I met him several times, but never for lunch, and I would like to see him again in that same character, is your former President Barack Obama. Um, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President and Ms. Ambassador for speaking to us today. My name is Priyanka Soni. I'm a first year student at uh, School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, first of all, I deeply admire your stand on demilitarization that furthers uh, global harmony and uh, regional stability. Uh, my question to you is that uh, the nuclear ban treaty is expected to be hampered by the earlier treaties mentioned by you, Ms. Ambassador, like nuclear non-proliferation treaty which have an inherent bias against the countries that are not P5. So how do you propose on uh, addressing? Also, Mr. President, I'd like to have lunch with Mr. Gandhi too, so. <laughs> we'll go together. <laughs> I'd love that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, can you please uh, repeat your question about the... Yeah, so the, the nuclear ban treaty is expected to be hampered by the earlier treaties, such as the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Uh, these treaties, they have an inherent bias against the countries that are not P5. They, they give the power P5 uh, to have nuclear weapons and not to the other countries. That's the reason countries like India, Pakistan, and Israel did not sign that treaty. So how do you plan on addressing that in the nuclear ban treaty? Well, um, it was a very straightforward message in the conference that this, this treaty had to be non, uh, non-discriminatory uh, treaty. And uh, that is the reason why you don't see uh, different kinds of, um, of legal obligations for, for different kinds of countries. 
but on the contrary, every, every uh, state that signs needs to abide by the rules, and there is, of course, for the nuclear weapon states, a process in which they will need to be accompanied by the international community until, until they become nuclear weapon uh, free states. But um, in general terms, um, let's say that uh, it's at least almost 50 years that separates one treaty from the other. Right? So we are departing from a different, a different perspective, and we are departing also uh, from the perspective that the um, elimination of nuclear weapons is a promise and a, a legal obligations that the nuclear weapon states uh, put on the table. Um, and it's imprinted in Article 6. That is the obligation to conduct negotiations in good faith to, to arrive at a nuclear weapons free world. And after the end of the Cold War, we didn't see uh, much progress in that regard. Um, so we depart from the idea that the, um, that the elimination of nuclear weapons is an imperative for all countries of the world. And at the same time, let us remember that the, the 122 countries that signed, many of them are already uh, state parties to uh, the, the treaties, the regional treaties uh, for the um, declaration of uh, nuclear weapon free zones. Therefore, we have uh, departed from regional treaties of regional treaties to a global norm that brings together all these, all these countries that, so we, it reinforces the non-proliferation and the disarmament regime in that term. Um, go ahead. Hi, Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm a post-baccalaureate student studying pre-med for now. Uh, mm -hmm. A few people suggest that after the first midterms I might have to switch to business or <laughs> international affairs, but We'll deal with that when it comes around. Anyway, I appreciate your work dealing with nuclear arms prolif proliferation, uh, etc. My number one concern is I'm taking full advantage of this forum this week, and I went to the World Health Organization conference the other day, and their number one concern is fighting the Zika virus. This is a major threat to Latin America, to your backyard. My immediate thought is the canal that's being done in Nicaragua if you understand the history of the Panama Canal, the mosquitoes being the number one killer, I would like to know how you guys plan to address biological warfare as well as your work with the nuclear arms. And second of all, I'm not really interested in who you guys are having lunch with in the future. I'm interested in who you're having lunch with today. And will you have lunch with me? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Listen, um, on, on the Zika virus, yes, it is a big concern for all countries, not, not only in the tropical areas. As you know, we've had also uh, Zika presence in uh, temperate countries such as the United States and Europe. And so the only way to handle that is through um, education in the ultimate analysis because it, it depends on, on controlling the vectors. And, uh, and the, the, the way to do that is preventing the mosquitoes to lay their eggs in stagnant waters and things like that. So in urban air areas, the, the, we have been dealing with, uh, with, with communities, making them understand the need to uh, dispose of water and, and, and adequately, especially in places like Costa Rica, the, where we, we have a, a long and intense rainy season. Um, that's one thing, and, and I think that the WHO, as well as uh, the regional um, health organizations, are doing a good job. And Zika has, by and large, um, been dealt with quite successfully, even when the, the, the cases are still very abundant. Um, regarding the canal in Nicaragua, well, there was a note, we, we, we thought that they were going to build a, a canal in Nicaragua, but it's not being built. Um, it, it seems to have been an oaks, a hoax. From, uh, from geopolitics. So there are many things being done in Nicaragua, not the canal. Regarding biological warfare, that's a different uh, area of, of international concern. And I think that there are other groupings of countries that are dealing with that. But I would like to use your question to highlight the fact that being uh, nuclear weapons such a significant issue for the future of the world, um, 
these other issues that you bring about have more immediate and direct impacts upon daily life. I mean, uh, nuclear, weapon, uh, nuclear weapons and the use of nuclear weapons are, let's, let's hope, are, is unlikely. I mean, generally we do not think it's going to happen until it happens. But these other issues, Zika, chemical, the use of chemical weapons, climate change and the things we don't do to, and what we, would happen if we don't take measures uh, are more immediate. I mean, they are things that are happening as we speak. The use of regular weapons, Costa Rica ha took part in a very strong campaign to control just the wep regular weapons, the ones that people use to kill students in schools or the universities, or to, to do illegal things in the streets. And this, for this, we, we also received high international praise under the Arias administration, our Nobel Peace Prize, uh, a few years back. So, you know, we ought to look, as you mentioned, to uh, other issues of world concern that also kill people, and they do uh, so in, in large numbers. And regarding lunch, I'm afraid we'll have to go to the airport from here. So <laughs> it'll be next time, but it will be delightful to have lunch with you. Next time, I can hold you to that. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we run out of time, but I would like to um, thank you, President Solis and uh, Ambassador White, for taking your time to come and visit us in a very busy week, I'm sure, and to give us a, such insightful speech on a topic that is so relevant to uh, the world that we're living in right now. And I think I, I speak on behalf of everybody here that we could only hope that more nations uh, could be as forward-thinking as yours, and for that, we thank you. Thank you very much.